So welcome to our second of a series of dialogues with uh, public health professionals, practitioners, and um, yeah, people are helping to save the planet, really. <laughs> so I'm here today with uh, Dr. Lillian Chung. So it's a great honor to have her here. She's a, a great practitioner as well as teacher and public health advocate. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, her background it's for all of you who are joining. Uh, first, let me just uh, turn off the waiting room so everyone can come in. Okay. So Dr. Lillian Chung is a, lect a lecturer, director of health promotion and communication, and director of mindfulness research and practice at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health's Department of Nutrition. She's the editorial director of the Nutrition Source, the school's nutrition website for health professionals, media, and consumers. She also serves as co-editorial director of the Obesity Prevention Source, a website providing science-based information for policy changes at the community level, as well as the Asian Diabetes Prevention Initiative, a website providing research-based evidence for policymakers and public with the goal of reversing the spread of type 2 diabetes in Asia. Her work focuses on the translation of science-based recommendations into public health communications and programs to promote healthy lifestyles for chronic disease prevention and control. And she is the co-principal investigator and co-author of Eat Well and Keep Moving, which is a globally disseminated school-based nutrition and physical activity program for upper elementary school children. And her other work includes her role as co-editor of Child Health, Nutrition, and Physical Activity with the late U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Julius Richmond. She's co-author of Be Healthy, It's a Girl Thing, Food, Fitness, and Feeling Great, a book written for adolescent girls. And her latest book is Savor, written with our teacher, Mind, uh, Savor, Mindful Eating, Mindful Life, which has been translated into 17 languages. Ooh, so many wonderful things that Lillian has brought to this world. And I'll say on top of that, I've known Lillian for a number of years, more than a decade. Uh, I think since the book Saver came out, I think I was helping you a little bit with the promotion and and it's just been such a gift to, to get to know you. And you've given so much back to our community to tie to, uh, few, not many people know, but Lillian helped engineer Thai, our teacher speaking at Google, <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> And she's just been a tireless advocate for bringing mindfulness into the public health discourse, which is something that Ty also dreamed about. And so I hope we'll have time to talk about that today as well. Um, so I just wanted to start out asking Lillian, Lillian, what inspired you to write the book Saver? And especially what inspired you to ask Ty to be co-author with you? Thank you, Brother Babu, for the introduction. When I went to the first retreat in 1997 in Key West, Florida, and it's entitled Opening the Door to Healing and Transformation, I had no idea who Thich Nhat Hanh is. But the title really attracted me because I needed it. So I went there. And as it's a week long retreat, and as like you all know, with Ty's teaching, he taught three things: mindful breathing, mindful walking, and mindful eating. My gosh, what is mindful eating? I've been a nutritionist all my life in terms of education, going through from undergrad to a doctoral degree. But I never heard about that term mindful eating, except from a psychologist, uh, Susan Elpis, who wrote a few books about it. And it's really for eating disorders and binge eating um, people who needed that help. So I was very, very intrigued by it. And um, so I, I kept going back to Thai's retreats every year as he came over to the U.S. And I felt that there, there is an urge inside me to really 
get the public more to know about what the essence of mindful eating is. Mindful eating is really eating for our own health as well as the health of the planet. Now, 25 years ago, very few people talk about eating for sustainability. But the Buddha was so wise. And so I thought it was very important to start informing the public about this. And I, I know that Thai usually will write the foreword because I am aware of his uh, routine with other books that people authored. But I have never seen him co-authored anything. And it was not really intentional, Brother Fatu. What happened was that I did the whole outline for the book. And I met with Thai along with Sister Chung Kong and Sister Annabelle up in Vermont, in the, mon uh, the monastery there. And I was sharing my outline with Thai. But with my academic background, <laughs> it was just so natural. I was just saying, okay, I spontaneously said to Thai. Thai, I will be citing you every other page. So why don't I write this book with you? My husband, who was sitting next to me, was horrified by my, my ask. And he even elbowed me a bit. But Thai took a long pause. And then he turned over to me and he said, why not? Oh, my gosh. That was it. Um, and what can I say? And that was the start of my very serious study into mindful eating. Mm. And I, I also like to share one point that I did not agree with Thai. Thai insisted that I put the sutra of on the sun's flesh ah, right. into the book. And I don't know whether the audience here knows about the sutra, but this, it's... This is the book we're talking about here. The, <laughs> <laughs> the sutra is pretty gross to me because it's about a couple crossing the desert, going for asylum, they ran out of food, and they had no choice but to kill the sun and eat a little bit of the flesh every day. That was like a parable from the, from the Buddha. And I resisted. I said to Thai, Thai, this is a pretty gross. I don't know when I should put it in there. Thai just smiled at me. And then before I knew it, I read in Thai magazine, he granted an interview. And he literally talked about eating the sun's flesh. So I guess his way of show, showing me that it is okay to use that sutra in the public because if Time Magazine described it and uh, the sutra in that article in the interview with him, it should be okay. So, yeah, and of course that sutra <laughs> is about how we effectively consuming our, our own children in the way that we live on the planet, right? When we live in a way that we waste resources as, as we have been doing for many generations now. So it's, it's a very profound teaching, but it's, it's, it's quite shocking too to hear. It, it, so it's a story of uh, the Buddha tells of two, uh, a, a couple with a small boy and they cross the desert and they realize halfway through the desert that they won't be able to survive all three of them. And they decide to kill their only son and eat his flesh in order so that two of them can continue through the desert and make it out. And, and then the Buddha asks um, his monks, 
uh, do you think that they enjoyed eating their only son? And of course, the monks say no. Must they? They beat their chest and tear, tore their hair out at the pain and suffering of having to do that. And he says, in the same way, when we should see eating edible food, it's like we are eating the flesh of our own son. And so it, it, it does have this transformative effect where, you know, in a, in a society where we just assume that food will be there in a way that really in most of human history, it hasn't been there. We, we rarely had, the, I mean, we've never really on the planet had such an excess of food as we do nowadays. So there is a deeper teaching, but yeah, I can see why <laughs> you're a little bit reluctant. <laughs> but it is in there. It is in there. <laughs> and, and I actually granted an interview um, maybe two years ago to Duke University. And they wanted to know about mindful eating. I actually read the sutra in that interview. And it's quite transformation is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very yeah. impressive in terms of using that as a way of, you know, illustrating what could be happening to mm -hmm. us. And and we have really have a very pretty dire situation right now mm -hmm. because the scientists is predicting that. Uh, Dr. Walter Willett, who is a co-principal uh, lead in this Eat Lancet study, and he'll talk more about it, I'm sure, is that by 2050, we will have 10 billion people. But if you don't, we don't shift towards a more plant-based way of eating, we don't have enough food mm. to feed everyone. So there is a lot of urgency right now to be shifting to a much more plant-based diet. Yeah. Lillian, I, I mean, this brings me to the next question I want to ask, which are what, mm -hmm. are, what are the greatest food crises that we are facing today? I mean, there's one, the production of food for an ever-growing world population. There's also the quality of the food and how we eat it. Right. So, uh, but I want to hear from you because this is something that makes up pretty much every day of your life, <laughs> understanding the crises that we're facing when it comes to nutrition. So I want to hear where, 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 what can we do and what, what are they and what can we do? Yeah. Um, we, in the U.S. recently, we had a White House conference on food and nutrition. The major focus was on food insecurity. Um, in the U.S., it's really, especially with the pandemic, it has been um, becoming worse. Mm -hmm. And currently, we have about 34 million people, um, including 9 million children who are experiencing food insecurity in the U.S. 9 million? Yeah. You know, a lot of the children used to be getting their food from school lunches, going to school, but the fact that they couldn't go to school, right? Mm. Then they don't have anything to eat at home from right. home, especially for the low income population. And the food deserts now all over America, where people are, don't have access to actually high quality food. And he left right. Yeah, standard quality food. <laughs> and it's really a problem. I think we need to have a major shift in the consciousness of the food industry uh, executive. Because right now in the, in our market, there are way too much sugar sweetened beverages, although they are starting to improve. And worldwide, there are soda taxes popping up in many different countries, which is a great thing. Mm. But still, if we go into the supermarket, there's plenty of highly refined carbohydrate foods that are really addictive. Mm. The science is showing that type of food can literally lit up 
your uh, the center, the part of the brain that makes you feel good. Hmm. And you want more of that. And the, the food industry knows about that. And so it's very sad to have that scenario still going on. And But the farm bill in the U.S. is not helping because the farm hmm. bill is not promoting the grow, growing healthy choices like more fruits and vegetables. Basically, it's wheat and soybeans and things like that, which they will be used for feeding the cattle. Mm. And then when you have so much wheat um, and also dairy, it's a major support from the farm bill. Mm. So it's a major, major policy issue in the U.S., yeah. And I think Europe is actually much better mm. in terms of realizing this. I noticed living in Plum Village when we'd go out to a a market, there there are a whole you know, kinds of food that you'd see normally in the U.S., which just aren't on the shelves there. They just can't sell them. <laughs> it's just not legal. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Right. And and so, I mean, you have to be vigilant everywhere, right? So, I mean, in Europe or wherever you are, you have to be aware of what kind of food you're consuming. But I just, at least there are some laws in place to protect people. That's right. Yeah. And and then we also, you know, diet, we have too high sodium. And the fast food is everywhere, as you know, and which is not the most healthy choices. But why are we paying so much attention to quality of food? Because how we eat, what we eat definitely affects mm. our risk of getting major chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer. And in the U.S., we have over 70% of our population being overweight or obese. That is really sad because of, mm. you know, obesity is also associated with health risks. Yeah. Mm. So we have a lot to do to improve yeah. the health of individuals. Another challenge is that anyone who writes a diet book and if it's a bestseller, can claim to be an expert. So the public is really confused at times. Mm. What should they believe? So I, that, I, for example, I start eating a certain diet, I feel great. And then I write a book about it and get everybody else on that. That's my evidence, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and whether or not it's a short-term or long-term thing, and that prompted me 21 years ago to start the Nutrition Source website. And because we want to make sure that it's scientifically valid, whatever mm -hmm. is put in there. And so, especially nowadays with social media, anyone can claim that whatever they eat helped them already. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. And I invite you all to visit our website, The Nutrition Source. We have a healthy eating plate that has been it's a graphic that shows you how to eat in terms of different types of food groups. And um, it's already translated to over 40 languages. Hmm. So Lily, I'd like to shift a little bit towards your personal path. You've shared a little bit already about going to the Key West Retreat. Maybe you could share, if, you, if you're willing, I've heard you share beautifully before about the kind of crisis that you encountered that kind of brought you to mindfulness practice where mindfulness helped you to create more resiliency, more spaciousness, even more insight really into what is, your life path is. Yes. It, I did not believe really the miracle of mindfulness with my first retreat. It was a seven day retreat. At that point, um, I have three sons uh, spanning from being four years old to 14. And I had 
been juggling a lot of my time between home and career with a major project that was funded by the Walton Family Foundation. The startup was really steep. I was notified in August of that uh, 93 to start it. And then I have to collect data in 14 public schools in Baltimore City in September. And I've been brought up in Buddhism and, but not the way Thai taught it. It's mm. a lot of just basically chanting, but not understanding mm. the principles of Buddhism. So when the mailer the, or the postcard came saying opening the door to healing and transformation, I jumped right there and signed up and be there. And I couldn't believe that, first of all, most or almost all the participants were health professionals, doctors, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists. And I said to myself, why are they there? What's going on? Hmm. And because I'm a nutritionist, I have no idea that mindfulness has so much um, a psychological aspect and, and effect on well-being. But the experience of that retreat was profound. I had three days of no stress. And as an adult, I never experienced it. And Thai actually sent us back to our room for half a day, one afternoon, to reflect on happiness. Hmm. what in your life can you name the things that make you happy hmm. what else do you need to be happy hmm. it was incredible because I still have the journal that I wrote down for that hmm. afternoon hmm. and I had two pages of things that I could identify that made me happy. Mm. And so it's so transformative. But mm. Thai is such an incredible teacher. There's something about the mind that we focus on those things that are not going well. That's and right. We kind of obsess with it. That's right. Obsess over it. And that's something we've been studying in the, the course, the certain week course, we've been studying understanding our mind and noticing how we through our perceptions, water these seeds of depression and anxiety. So that's really, I mean, Tai's doing a, an exercise to train us to have a new habit of watering the positive seeds in our consciousness by just sitting there and writing a list of all those conditions <laughs> that are there that make us happy. And it's so simple, but I, I've done it too many times. It's so powerful. I've done it with teachers as well as an exercise. It's amazing. It is. But he, warned us as he said goodbye to us in that retreat he said some of you may have touched some peace in this retreat but if you go home and do not continue to practice you're gonna lose it all <laughs> and i took it to heart i said i cannot lose this this is too <laughs> precious and the way he taught it is like even if you start with 1% of your waking hours being mindful, it's okay. Just mm -hmm. increase it stepwise. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I have increased my degree of mindful living quite a bit. And uh, despite of juggling many different roles and demands of academia, I have to say, I don't have any more stress. <laughs> it's quite a miracle. But it's quite a miracle. I mean, we were recently there visiting you in, in Boston and and I talked, I was sitting at a table with your sons and, and I said, where does she get all the energy to do all these amazing things that Lillian is doing? Because you you, you really are helping so many people with the websites, with the uh, yeah, working within the Harvard School of Public Health. I, I wanted to share a little bit or get some input from you about the Harvard School of Public Health, because in schools of public health in general, 
this wasn't on the list of questions that I sent, but I I I had this insight when I uh, got to know some of the professors talking with the deans there, and uh, when I was there in August, that um, a public health school is basically an evidence based activist organization. I mean, it's people who are using science as a basis for their advocacy, and and, and you know so many. Uh, academic institutions are just kind of research based we just they just study something to try to establish the validity of it but here we have a a, a school that is training young people to mm -hmm. base action it means policy change policy implementation on science so it, i i didn't somehow i just never had realized that this is what a public health school is doing <laughs> is about changing the world. It's really about collective awakening. And so that's why I named this course Collective Awakening, because I suddenly realized this, what, what's going on here with this public health movement. <laughs> that's right. Especially with COVID. Um, right. Public health has kind of risen in terms of the public's recognition of its importance. Because... School of Medicine, people recognize you will have the health system, you have the doctor that can take care of you. But what on earth is public health? <laughs> it's actually everything, as soon as we wake up, one of uh, uh, Dr. Howard Cole, who is a faculty with us and also being the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Service during the Obama's uh, administration said, Everything we use, we even the air, the quality of air is about public health. The mm -hmm. quality of water, you know, when you, what you drink, what you eat, and uh, the neighborhoods issues, uh, transportation, everything, the whole environment, how it um, impacts your health. Is part of public health. Mm. Yeah, now we, we look back in the archaeological record and we see that when humans start to live in urban centers, we started to get, like, for example, smallpox, which mm -hmm. was very hard to transmit in tribal hunter gatherer societies. It would be transmitted, but on a very low level. But suddenly, when you get people together in high urban situations, you have it seems like these diseases come out of nowhere, but they're actually already there in the system. It's just when the, the the proximity of so many people. And then another is when we settled down and we started growing wheat and having all of these you yes. know carbohydrates, then suddenly you see that our teeth started getting really bad. <laughs> and yet you see hunter gatherers with perfect teeth. Yes. You know, even <laughs> they don't have occlusion from their wisdom teeth because they were chewing so much fibrous material. That's right. And stimulating the growth of their jaw, which we all can do too if we spent time chewing on leaves <laughs> for half the day <laughs> when we were kids. But you know, you, so so these are all public health issues which have been going on. I mean, at least since the agricultural revolution. That's right. Um, as I said, I mentioned earlier, it's about the food industry is refining our foods too much. And we are much better off with the whole grains and the lentils, mm. you know, things mm. like that, than buying all these convenient stuff. So. Mm. Mm. I, I want to ask, um, this kind of brings us into how what do you see as immediate changes we can make at an individual and a collective level to transform our suffering in relation to nutrition? Ah, oh, there are many levels. I think uh, this is why I also started another initiative based on eat well and keep moving. And I would like to incorporate mindfulness into the curriculum as well. Mm. Um, so that it will not address healthy lifestyle as also mindfulness that could help an individual and as they grow up to manage the stress and eat mindfully and really be aware of not just their own bodies, but how their actions could be affecting their immediate community as well as the world at large. 
mm. because there is a whole movement right now and and thanks to Thai's teaching right now I've been invited to a global campaign on mindful eating it's in the formative stages mm. but it involves all faith and people around the world and the people who uh, got me involved they just realized that for sustainability's sake populations around the world needs to eat much more mindfully need to eat much less beef and mm -hmm. items food items that gives a lot of greenhouse gases and mm -hmm. which means to be much more plant-based mm -hmm. and we are in an active phase of you know preparing this grant and to be funded and it started with the vatican and but the vatican uh the pope actually invited all faith to be involved mm -hmm. so i was in london just three weeks ago something like that meeting about this so mm -hmm. we'll see how things evolve mm -hmm. that's i mean it's very hopeful I, you mentioned greenhouse gases it's it, it was it really shocked to me how much for example food transport mm -hmm. but also the wasting of food how much food like good edible food is just thrown away i mean th these are two major contributors to the climate that's crisis right yeah in america especially we have yeah. a major food waste problem and this is why i'm hoping that we can have the school-based curriculum to uh, really get uh, children uh, to to be exposed to all these concepts while they were young uh, young mm. this way at least it becomes a habit mm. and it will be natural to them it's just like when families grow up in plum village mm. we yeah. you know they practice in a way that is really good for mm. sustainability already mm. Mm. You know, the way you wash your dishes, use the water, everything else mm. is very sustainable. So I, when I started, I, I did the children's program for eight years in in Plum Village. And one of the things we changed right away when um, the group of us I was with when we came in to do the program was just to have a piece of fruit that was in season from a local farmer for a snack. I mean, it, it was so simple. <laughs> I saw some of the food that we were teaching mindfulness to the kids, but sometimes when, when we went to get snacks for the kids, it was not reflective. <laughs> That's right. And, and 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 then also the the like you said, the highly refined carbohydrates would make the kids very excitable, very um kind of like ants in your pants kind of running around all the time but when they would eat this fresh fruit they would be calm they could sit for 10 minutes in silence sometimes just enjoying like a, a the apricot they we you know like you know of course with your book we practice to see the sun and the rain and the farmer in the apricot and it's not difficult to do when it's grown mm -hmm. on a tree just within a few miles of plum village so anyway, this is these are some ways that I, I kind of like learned how to, well, by practicing mindful eating myself, to to kind of transmit it to the next generation, and um, and and we've been working um, just so everyone knows we've the past two years Lillian uh, brought together some well myself as a monk <laughs> along with a group at Dartmouth a Median Health Behaviors Lab. Professor Diamond Gilbert, uh, Professor um, Diane Gilbert Diamond, and Raina Lanzigan, who's the research manager of the lab, and we've been doing a study, a pilot study, on the effects of mindfulness on children's eating habits. And there's been some a lot of good insights that have come out of that pilot study. And now we're designing a more, uh, I think, an eight-week uh, study. Mm -hmm. 
as well, and which will include, uh, you know, developing a training program for kids. And so it'd be very interesting to see how that can go deeply into the collective consciousness. That's right. It's very exciting. I'm just thrilled mm. that Brother Fab Lu, you are there with us because um, Diane uh, was having kind of a block in her head because when she presented her data to our department a few years ago, she didn't know how to counteract the food commercials that targeted children. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was literally having a big smile in the back, almost wanting to wave to her as she was talking. I said, there is a way. <laughs> like, yeah. that the way Thai teachers taught Mindful eating and the way that children are taught with mindfulness is the way. Lillian, I wanted to ask, how did you, in, so you went to the retreat in Key West and then you put it, it, the practice, you put into practice the teachings that Ty gave you. So how, how, how do, what is the, what is the meal like in your house with your kids growing up? What, 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 how are you, because a lot of parents ask me this, how can I bring mindful eating into the meals in my house? Because they, the kids are grabbing food out of the refrigerator. Many families no longer sit down and have a meal together, even one meal in, in a day. So how, how, what, what skillful, <laughs> skillful means did you draw from to, in order to bring up, because your, your sons are so lovely. I mean, I, I've met them a number of times. And, and so I see that the, you know, the proof is in the pudding in a sense. How, how did you do it? How, what, how did you translate those teachings into your family sure. life? Well, first of all, I'm the food police. I make sure that when <laughs> I shop for groceries, I don't have all the junk in my house. They may be sneaking once a while when they're <laughs> out there, but at least the pantry won't have the big bags of whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, we do have every night a dinner together. Mm. And that's important. I think, well, we won't have a silent meal like the retreat because we want to connect with mm. the children. Mm -hmm. But the blessing is that all three of them have been in a retreat with Thai. Mm. So they at least know the fundamentals. And um, we just almost like uh, my husband and I just do it by example. We don't force them to be sitting with us and meditating at all. But we practice mindfulness in our behavior, in our speech. And if they get angry, we try to listen to them mm. and figure out why they are so hot tempered. Mm. And so especially with teenage years, it's very challenging. <laughs> and, You've gone yes. through three boys as teenagers. <laughs> oh, gosh. And, <laughs> That's why I needed to go to Thai's retreat every year. <laughs> but now there's so wonderful young men, right? So well, it's the Dharma reign. I mean, mm. it, they, it's so incredible. His teaching is just... Uh, and the Sangha concept, that's another thing that I, I really loved about Thai uh, emphasizing it at that point I didn't know what it's all about you know okay Sangha 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 but nowadays when I click your Plum Village world map of Sanghas and I have friends who are in need and depressed and have problems I literally just ask them to find a Sangha in their neighborhood hmm. And the sanghas are so helpful because they would invite the bell, they have a period of meditation together, and they practice uh, deep listening, loving speech, and mm. everything that Thai stressed. Mm. And it's, it's almost like magical that 
these sanghas are everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Well, it, it people get transformation. I think I, yeah, that is the thing that makes this all happen. If it were not working, then we don't do much advertisement. <laughs> No. We, we can barely keep our websites running <laughs> but you know somehow through word of mouth through the power of Thai's presence and and the practicality of his teachings because there can be teachers who have a powerful presence but actually you, you can't realize what they have realized and, and what drew me to this community 20 years ago was the fact that i could see in his students mm -hmm. the power of the practice because he, it means it's a teacher who can transmit his teaching that 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 got my interest <laughs> because there are there are amazing teachers but yes. are they able to transmit their teaching and you know and i see that in you your ties continuation <laughs> the wonderful things you're doing at harvard and um you know i see that in my brothers and sisters and you know in in, in all of us that have uh, been practicing and getting the joy and happiness and transformation of suffering from Thais teaching mm -hmm. well, thank you so much Lillian for being with us today this is really great this is like a great compliment to um, this course where we've been reading through a selection of Thais books I mean my, my kind of secret idea was that <laughs> maybe you know if there's a course in the future at Harvard School of Public Health on Thais books we can draw from some of these insights we've been having I think there are about 400 people on the course right now. Um, so we, we will have this video for them to and possibly put it out for the public later on, maybe beginning of next year. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share just as a message? Well, I think Ty has talked about a few themes that I treasure, especially and I, I wasn't taught in university at all. And uh, it's the interbeing and interconnectedness mm. that is so important. And when he gave me this quote in Savor, it just said it all. The apple in your hand is the body of the cosmos. Yeah. Right. And another important concept that I learned from him it's no mud, no lotus. Mm -hmm. So suffering is okay. Uh, without the suffering, we really cannot embrace happiness because I actually knew of people from very well-to-do families who have it all, but they are not happy. Yeah. So suffering actually serves a very good purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I'm just so blessed to have learned all these. And then in the first retreat already, when Tai talked about passing and the whole concept of cloud never dies. Mm. And he and Sister Chung Kong visiting uh, a dear friend who is dying. Mm. That Dharma was so incredible. Mm. And um, it's, we are all very blessed mm. to be, have mm. Thai's teaching with us. Mm. So, Brother Fat Lu, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lillian. And so, you're uh, always welcome. Yeah. So we'll finish here for this dialogue. And I think many of you know as well, and I think Lillian will also maybe perhaps also join. We'll, in a few minutes, we'll have a, a di second dialogue with Dr. Walter Willett, also of the Harvard School of Public Health. And I would just say, if any one of you have any questions in the um, mindful eating aspects, please share with Brother Fat Lu, and he will send forward it to me. Yeah, I can create a, on the forum that we have for the course, I can put that as a post. And if anyone has any questions, please uh, just write it there and then I make sure that Lillian will get it. Thank you. Thank All you. Right, bye bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>